In this lab number four, we learned how to use a wedged shear plate interferometer to assist in optical testing calculations such as focal lengths of mirrors and lenses and radius of curvature of wave fronts. In order to do this, we had to design a new beam expander where W prime was large enough without overfilling the entire aperture of the shear plate interferometer. The underfilling condition is crucial as overfilling will result in energy loss due to the clipping of the beam. After building the beam expander as shown, we introduced a shear plate to check for collimation. We used the 2 inch wedged shear plate as opposed to the 1 inch since we found in lab 3 that we got better testing sensitivity using the larger one. The purpose for using a shear plate in general is to see if your system is collimated or not or whether it's diverging or converging. Using the beam waist W0 calculated in the second lab and the focal length of the microscope objective, we were able to find the beam divergence angle. This angle is the same for the collimated lens, and since we know the size of the beam at its output, we were able to solve for its focal length. It's worth mentioning that even though our calculation told us to use a collimating lens with 400 millimeter focal length, we used a 500 instead because that was provided, but it actually helps to make sure that we underfill the aperture. It works by introducing fringes created by the interference of beams. The shear plate we used is a wedged plate, meaning that its two surfaces are planar but not perfectly parallel to each other and are separated by a very small angle known as the wedge angle. Beams incident on the front side of the plate will travel a shorter distance, while beams incident on the back side of the plate will travel a longer distance. This difference in optical path lengths creates interference. Now that we had everything set up, we began the first experiment, which was to place the low power mirror with a 100 meter focal length after the shear plate and actually rotate the plate such that the reflected light from the beam was incident on the surface. We observed the fringes at one location close to the shear plate and then further from the shear plate. We took some measurements here, such as shear distance, which is the center to center beam offset between the first and second reflection. We did this by placing an aperture before the reflected beam hit the shear plate and observing the two small dots on the shear plate screen. Using a ruler and protractor, we measured the shear distance, fringe spacing, and angular deviation. From this equation, you can see the shear distance is proportional to the thickness of the shear plate itself and depends on angle of incidence on the surface and refractive index. These are our results. Our other experiment with this setup involved the use of a good quality reference lens and a high power mirror of focal length equal to 100 millimeters. This is what the setup looked like. After roughly estimating the focal point of the lens, aka moving the aperture up and down on the rail until we saw the smallest point, we inserted the mirror at that location and again observed the fringes. We located the horizontal fringes at two positions and took similar measurements here. Notice the fringes have an S shape to them, meaning that we're experiencing spherical aberrations. As a result, we were able to find the radius of curvature of the mirror by taking the difference of those two position measurements, and we also found the focal length. Overall, the take-home message is that as long as you are able to measure the shear distance S, the fringe space in D, and the deviation angle alpha of the fringe, then you can figure out the radius of curvature of the passing wave front and even focal lengths of the lenses and mirrors. Thanks for listening.